April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Today, church bells will chime 13 times in memory of the 13 children in Eastern Virginia region who died in 2019 due to abuse or neglect. Child abuse deaths are preventable. Each of us can help lower the number of maltreated children in our communities. As we are called to defend the defenseless, to show love to those who know no love, and to bring justice to those who are abused, we can. We can learn about the four major types of child maltreatment, physical, sexual, emotional, and neglect. We can be an active voice in our church. We can use our volunteer energy to advocate. We can offer encouragement and empathy for struggling parents. We can volunteer in local organizations. And if a child discloses maltreatment to you, we can listen to them, tell them we believe them, and tell them it's not their fault. If you know or suspect a child is being abused, please report that abuse to the Virginia State Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-552-7096. If a child is in immediate danger, please call 911. For further information to volunteer or to contribute, visit www.championsforchildrenhr.org. With hope and contemplation for action, let us now in prayer remember. Amen.
Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this service of worship on this second Sunday of Easter. We're continuing to celebrate Easter as we praise God for our risen Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. A little mechanical difficult. Here we go. Now, we're, we're ready to go. Everyone is welcome here, and we are certainly glad that you have joined us for this virtual worship. And when we are able to gather together physically, we hope that you would join us in person as well. Meanwhile, we're staying in touch through our church chat email and telephone call system. And if you would like to be on our call or email list, please uh, let us know by sending an email uh, and with your email address and phone number to office at suffolkchristian.org. Now, I just wanted to remind you that when you go out, please wear your mask. And though we have closed our building, we have not closed our outreach. So please stay in touch with us and, and connected with each other. And if there is a need, please let us know. I know that some of you are looking for masks and they have become uh, quite scarce along with some other products that we, we need on a daily basis. So I would like to tell you that we do have some masks available. And if you would call me on my cell number at 757-620-2628 or send an email to the office address, we would be glad to see that you can get uh, a, a mask as well. Again, I wish to thank our wonderful worship team made up of Edie, Jim, Dana, Sean, Abigail, Phoebe, and Carmen for helping to put together this worship service. And I also want to thank Amy Peterson, our church secretary, for publishing the links uh, in the emails where you can find this service. So please join in with our call to worship. Lord, as we gather as the Church of Jesus Christ, we celebrate that we are forgiven people. May we, like you, be generous in offering forgiveness to others. Thank you for forgiving us every day for the many ways we fall short of your mercy. Teach us to embody your grace, your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness to all those we encounter this day. Let us worship our God. Our gracious and loving God, as we gather together here in this church and in our homes, scattered about, may we 
be your people and lift our hearts and voices in praise of your holy name. You are the great God. You're the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of all people and all things. All of creation is in your loving hands, and we rest assured. prayer in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus, praying together as he taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy heaven. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Well, the mission of Suffolk Christian Church is to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ by sharing God's grace, love, and forgiveness. And this mission is not hindered by our current quarantine and our requirement of social distancing. We're still reaching out, we're still serving, we're still confessing and witnessing to our faith. And I want to thank all of you for your faithfulness in sharing your love and commitment with our church fellowship. One day, we will be permitted to come back together again here in this house of God. Many of us have, have been thinking about that first Sunday back, and we would like your ideas. If you have a suggestion or a comment or an observation, of particularly about that first Sunday back, use our office at Suffolk Christian Church email address, and we certainly want that first Sunday back together uh, to be a wonderful, joyous celebration. Would you join me in our unison offertory prayer? Heavenly Father, you have given each of us gifts to use as members of the body of Christ. Here are our gifts, the work of our hands, our hearts, and our lives. We pray that they may help to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to our world today and always, here and everywhere. Amen. And I think I can still hear that young lady who always makes the announcement, it's time for the Lambs Club. Good morning, boys and girls. It is time for the Lambs Club. And I want you to repeat with me what the Lambs Club is all about. Ready? Living as my Bible says. And our Bible says that we should live how? To be kind every day. Now, I've got a story for you today. And it's a story not about a lamb, but there is a lamb in the story. The story is about Sneaky Snake. Now, there's two parts to sneak, Sneaky Snake's, that's hard to say. Sneaky, sn sn <laughs> let's try that again. Sneaky Snake's life, and you can get the first part of that if you'll ask mom or dad to go on YouTube and type in sneaky, S-N-E-A-K-Y, snake, S-N-A-K-E, and Mr. Tom T. Hall has a very special song about that. 
For you see, in his earlier life, uh, Sneaky Snake liked to steal root beer. And that didn't make him popular with people who had root beer. But then after that, Sneaky Snake said, you know, I'm going to turn the corner. I'm going to have a new life. I think I'll go out and make me a friend. So Sneaky Snake went to his mother and said, now, Mom, I know all of the snakes that are around us here, but I want to meet someone who is different from me, someone who is not a snake, someone who is just altogether different, and we can enjoy a friendship, and I can learn about them, and they can learn about me. And his mother thought that was a wonderful idea. So off he goes, slithering through the grass, and he looked up, and there was uh, Rebecca Robin, and she was looking in the ground, and all of a sudden her beak went into the ground, and she came up with a worm, and Sneaky Snake said, I'll bet she would like me because worms look like snakes, even though they're smaller. Okay. So he slithers a little faster, but before he could get there, Rebecca Robin had already taken off to go to her nest, and he said, well, I'll keep looking. I think I'll go down by the lake. And he went down by the lake, and he looked over, and there was a turtle. He said, now that's a strange-looking friend, but I think I'll go try to make friends with that turtle. So he slithered down to the turtle. The turtle, turtle saw him coming, and you know what turtles do when they get frightened. He pulls his tail in, he pulls his back legs, his front legs, his head. And Sneaky Snake said, now he looks like a rock. I can't really be friends with a rock. Oh, goodness, I think I'll go down by the barn. So Sneaky Snake takes a left, and he heads off to the barn, and there were lots of farm animals, and one in particular caught his attention right away. Now, this animal had four legs and wasn't very big, and the coat on that animal was white and very curly, and it looked just as clean as it could be. And that, he found out, he slithered up, and he said, Hello, my name is Sneaky Snake. Would you like to be my friend? And the little lamb said, I'm Lenny Lamb. Yes, I would. Now, there's, a, there's a, a, an important lesson. Lucy Lamb had taught Lenny Lamb, number one, to always be nice to strangers and to be friendly to them and to find out all that he could about the other person. And so Sneaky Snake and Lenny Lamb made a friendship they were different as they could be. They liked to eat different foods. Uh, Sneaky Snake, of course, didn't have any legs, so he had to crawl on his belly, whereas uh, Lenny Lamb could run on his four legs. But it was a friendship that was blessed by God because two people reached out to each other. And I hope you can do that as well. So if you'll join me in prayer... I'm going to hold my hand out, and you hold your hand out as if we were holding hands like we do here on Sunday mornings, and you repeat after me, okay? Dear Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. Thank you for friends who are different from us but who also love you. But who also love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Bye-bye.
now and as it always has been and always will be, our greatest weapon against the powers of darkness. As the, the Apostle James reminds us, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then he says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. As we pray today, uh, please remember P.J. Fowler and his family in the death of his sister. We're turning to God in, time, in these times of fear and uncertainty just the same as we would in times of joy and celebration. So please join as we pray for God's heart of mercy and truth to dwell in us, to show us how to face the challenges posed by this vi virus that has come upon us. As a framework for our prayer today, I'm using a prayer developed by World Vision, which is a renowned Christian uh, world relief organization, and it's a special prayer that is aimed at the coronavirus. So in this first section, pray for the virus to stop spreading. Almighty God, we know that everything is in your sovereign control, and we ask that you would keep this new virus from continuing to spread, that you would give government officials the ability to safely handle people that are arriving from other countries. Help us, O oh Lord, to stay home and follow the instructions of social distancing and comfort families even as they must make that terrible decision to stay away from their elderly or high-risk families. And Psalm 46 reminds us, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Let us now pray for people who are affected infected with the virus or facing quarantine. Lord Jesus, during your ministry on earth, you showed your power by care and caring by healing people of all ages and all stations of life, healing them from physical, mental, and spiritual ailments. We ask that you would be present now to those who need your loving touch because of the virus. And may they feel your power of healing through the care of doctors and nurses. And Philippians 4, 6 reminds us, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request, request for God. Let us pray for medical professionals, caregivers, and researchers responsible for fighting this new virus. Oh God, as more people get sick, Healthcare workers and first responders are working longer hours with fewer supplies and with more risk of contracting the virus themselves. We pray that you would renew their energy and sustain them on their long shifts at work, that you would bring your protection upon them as they work with patients, and that you would multiply their supplies and so they have so that they have the protective items needed to stay safe on the job. And from the 23rd Psalm, we are reminded that even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let us now pray for leaders responsible for making decisions about this new virus. Our Father, we seek your wisdom daily be with those who make decisions that affect the lives and futures of our families, our communities, and even the world. We pray that they would communicate clearly, truthfully, and calmly, not only with the public, but with each other, and that their messages would be received and would be followed. May truth and empathy be the touchstones of people setting policies for our protection. And in 1st, 2nd Corinthians chapter 1, St. Paul reminds us, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us 
as you help us by your prayers. Let us pray for families who are adjusting to new ways of life. Holy Spirit, as families adjust to everyone being home, and as businesses and schools close, we ask that you would guide people in these new days of new realities. Give spouses grace for each other. Prompt parents who are by now worn out to speak words of kindness and encouragement to their children and help children to find creative ways to experience the beauty of all that you have created. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. That from Psalm 57. Let us pray for business owners, families facing financial stress. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness and how you have guided people and that you have provided in the past. It's overwhelming. It's scary. Many do not know how bills and obligations will be met. People are feeling financial strain during these days of uncertainty, and we pray that you would bring them comfort and peace, providing for them in their hour of need. In John 14, Jesus told his disciples, Peace I leave, leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. And as many of us have personally had this interaction, let us now pray for grocery store workers and those delivery drivers. Lord, we are so grateful for all people who are able to continue to work each day so that people can eat and have what they need. We ask that you would bless them and protect them as they serve, give them grace to handle customers that all are not always nice to them. Keep their bodies healthy as they unload and stock boxes of supplies. Keep their automobiles and trucks running smoothly as they deliver these needed supplies. Please protect them all from contracting this new virus. And from Lamentations chapter 3. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning Great is your faithfulness. And from Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious in anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Lord, we love you and we give ourselves to you, asking that you would keep us in your loving care now and always. As we pray in the Spirit and through the name of Jesus our Lord. Con este imprevisible va a In the darkest hour, a 
when I cannot breathe, fear is on my chest, the weight of the world on me, everything is crashing down, everything I had known. thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about, I can't stop thinking about your goodness, goodness. I can't stop thinking about, I can't stop thinking about, I can't stop thinking about your goodness, goodness. You have always been faithful to me. I remember, I remember, even when my own eyes could not see, you were there, always. Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel according to John, the chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter said, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. 
Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. And to his name be honor and glory. Amen. If you'll permit me a production note here, Edie, I have put new batteries in the body pack. Well, I think I did. <laughs> well, just uh, this would be a good time to go get yourself a drink of water and, uh, well, I don't know what's, well, we'll just go with the pulpit mic. It's always helpful in these days after Easter to go back and reread the narratives in the four Gospels about the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the events after the resurrection. Each of these writers had their own sources of information, and Matthew and John, of course, were first-person eyewitnesses to these events. And I think that we see in the aftermath of these truly miraculous events that a question hung over the disciples and the other followers of Jesus, and it is this, what's next? Have you asked that question recently in your own life? Well, of course you have. There's great uncertainty as to whether we will ever return to the quote-unquote normal that we had experienced for so long. And so what's next is a truly valid and very timely question. Well, let's look for a moment about how the disciples address this question in their situation. We can only imagine the mental and psychological confusion that hung over these followers of Jesus. Taking in the recent events of watching their Lord die this horrible death, and then being told uh, on the third day that he was not in the grave, and then some of them actually seeing him, it was a lot to take in. So I'm sure they were still trying to work all this out in their mind. It was probably therapeutic to them to simply take a moment and go fishing. After all, that's what most of them did before they met Jesus. So they went back to their roots, so to say, and I'm sure that the cold, damp air of that early morning uh, and the physical labor of throwing the nets over the side and then hauling it in uh, did their bodies, if not their souls, a lot of good. So after this man who had appeared on the shore told them to cast their nets in a different place, they in fact did uh, 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 catch a, what has been called a miraculous draft of fish. They came ashore and found the man, recognized him as Jesus, and they were invited to have breakfast with him. Some have suggested that the meal that they shared together with Jesus was like a Eucharist or a Holy Communion. Now, can you imagine how Peter must have felt? He had done a terrible thing. He had put his own welfare above that of Jesus and had even cursed at the young maid when she persisted and wanted to know if he was one of the followers of this man from Galilee. And so finally, here he was face to face with this one that he had literally sold down the river. We could even go f as far to suggest that his failure to acknowledge his relationship with Jesus perhaps was in the same ballpark with the betrayal of Judas. Oh my, what's next? I'm sure Peter wondered. But Jesus had the situation covered. He simply asked, do you love me? Three times he asked that question. And three times Peter affirmed his love. It sounded, sounded to me like, as I heard the scripture uh, read this morning, that by the third time, 
Peter was getting just a little bit exasperated, like, Lord, haven't you been listening? You know that I love you. And Jesus seems to be saying to Peter, what's next for you is serving my people. And although Jesus didn't specify exactly what that might entail, I think Peter had a pretty good idea because he had spent three years with Jesus, uh, watching him care for all the little lambs of God, healing them, giving them encouragement, feeding them, sharing with them the love of God, and inviting them to come into the kingdom of God. That truly was a critical high moment for Peter. Have you ever had what could be called a Peter moment? That would be a moment when you let the Lord down big time. I read the story of one pastor's description of his personal Peter moment, and I'd like to share it with you. And here's what he writes. It was in the early years of my ministry when I set out clear and appropriate expectations for the children who made up my confirmation class. Confirmation is a big event, he says, in the Lutheran church, and children prepare often for two years to participate in this wonderful spiritual rite of passage. One of the expectations we had was that young people in the confirmation class would participate in the annual confirmation retreat. It was always an exciting weekend that summarized the year and helped to deepen the friendships among the young people. And, and one of the purposes was they hoped to retain them in their high school years, in their youth program. The church had stressed the retreat as a requirement, but when the big weekend came, Karen Nagy never arrived at the church. I called her home, there was no answer, so we had to go without her. Karen, he explains, was the daughter of a single mother who worked very hard to provide for her family. Karen's mother did not worship at the church, but she did make sure that her children were in Sunday school and church every week. But somehow, she did not get her daughter to that required retreat, and a 28-year-old pastor himself had no room for such human failure. He says, I ruled that Karen could not be confirmed with her class. I'll never forget her heart-sick mother pleading with me one afternoon to please let her daughter be confirmed, especially because her grandmother was flying in from Chicago for the occasion. But I said no. We had expect expectations, and Karen had not fulfilled them. Over 40 years have passed since I made that horrible decision. I still grieve over the pain that I caused that mother and her teenage daughter. What was I thinking? How could I have been so heartless? I failed that family that day. I bought, brought discredit to the office of pastor, and I believe that in this my Peter moment, I too denied Jesus. The questions that jump out at me are these two. What was I thinking, and how could I have been so heartless. Now, in the 40 years since that unfortunate incident, this pastor, I am sure, had several come to Jesus decisions. And so he goes on with his story to tell us. That is why today, he writes, 
I am so strongly opposed to arbitrary rules and regulations that would seek to separate people from the church, erecting barriers and sending a message that someone is not good enough to be counted among those who love and serve the Lord. Jesus came, he reminds us, that we might know the love of God and achieve the fullness of our potential as the beloved children of a heavenly Father. Therefore, anything we do that belittles or rejects anyone or implies that such a person is not welcome in our midst is wrong and must be changed. That really touched me. That seems to be following on with what I try to say each Sunday morning, that everyone is welcome here. And if any are not welcome, then I too am not welcome. So what's next for you? Like Peter, is there some confessing that you need to do? Is there some reconciliation? Is there a God or maybe more than one God that you have put before the Lord and need to get rid of? Is there a commitment to our church fellowship that you need to renew and rekindle? But let's take it another step. What's next for Suffolk Christian Church? Is it that we will continue business as usual when the quarantine has ended or will we seek God's guidance for perhaps new ways of doing ministry will I or you we each have to answer this for ourselves but will I insist on my own private agenda my own personal likes or dislikes when it comes to activities and worship styles or Will I truly be open to God's spirit? If we do nothing, I fear that one day down the road of time, this building will be a hollow museum, a tribute to an earlier day which is no more. And I'm feeling, quite frankly, a bit of urgency, as perhaps some of you are feeling as well. But urgency should never propel us into making hasty decisions. God knows where we are and what we should be about. God knows that we need to take our time to listen to the leading of God. I would like to repeat the invitation that I gave you last Sunday it was an in invitation to follow the resurrected Jesus, an invitation to renew your faith, an invitation to serve Jesus, an invitation for you so to let your light shine that others may see Jesus reflected in your thoughts, your words, and your loving deeds. And I close that invitation with this blessing. May God bless you, may God's grace be upon you, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours today and for all time. And since we're still celebrating Easter, join me. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.
our Savior and the Father's boundless love. With the Holy Spirit's favor rest upon you from above. Thus may we abide in union with each other and the Lord and possess in sweet communion joys that the earth cannot afford. Go in peace.